Good morning to everyone. We welcome you to the worship service of the First Baptist Church Capitol Hill here in Nashville, Tennessee. We're so glad that you're able to join with us on this Sunday morning. This is March the 13th. This is the second Sunday of the season of Lent, second Sunday of the season of Lent. We know that Lent is a time of sacrifice, it's a time of giving up, it's a time of our reflecting and, and uh, seeking repentance for the things that we have done and the things that are not right in our lives. It's a part of the 40-day procession that we have leading us up to, uh, up to Easter. It's interesting this past week that um, here it is, we are actually one week before the beginning of spring, but yet during this past week, we had snow, snow on the ground, snow uh, all across the state of Tennessee, from Memphis all the way up to uh, far east Tennessee. Just reminds me of the fact that God does not operate on the same calendar we operate on. God doesn't care what our thoughts may be. God doesn't even care about the fact we say that spring is on the horizon. God does what God feels is best in whatever time frame God chooses to do that. And I'm grateful for that. And it's in that gratitude that I'm willing to come and desiring to come to share in worship with God, and to worship the God who loves us, the God who cares for us, the God who provides for all of our needs according to God's riches in glory. We're so grateful that we're able to share in worship, break away from all the other things that are happening in our world, um, and making sure that we remind ourselves of that which is the center of our, should be the center of our lives and the center of our joy. I know also on today it is Daylight Savings Time, and I am very confident that all of you who are looking at me right now are watching it live and in living color. Of course, uh, that probably is not true. Some of you perhaps did not adjust your clocks, uh, your, uh, your phones did not set the way they need to and you're watching this on a delayed, on a delayed basis, yet doesn't make any difference. The Word of God is always fresh, it's always alive, it's always vibrant, no matter when we hear it. And so we're grateful that you're able to join in with us. As a part of our joining in, we ask that you will tune other things out, that you tune out anything that can become a distraction, whether it's something physically in your space where you are, or something that is emotional upon your heart or your mind or your spirit. Pray that, no, let me ask you to do something even differently than that. That instead of just pushing it away, place it on the altar. Place it on the altar of God. Let God handle those things for you. Let God handle uh, those uh, burdens for you. Let God handle those traumas, those things that are happening in your lives. Let God handle that as you come to the Lord to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. I ask that we will now bow our heads and offer our own prayers unto the Lord as we seek to center ourselves to get our hearts, our minds, and our spirits ready for worship.
my all in all. How about you this morning? We're going to stand together and sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. There is a name. like music in my ear oh oh how I love Jesus Because he dared wrap himself in flesh, become our Lord and Savior, deliver us from our damnation. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. Let us go to God in prayer this morning. Shall we pray? Oh, most gracious Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, creator of all the stars, the planets we see in our universe. God, you are God all by yourself, 
There's none beside you, none under you, none above you, for you are God, almighty God. And we come this morning to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. Lord, it's cold outside, but we feel the warmth of your glory in this space. Meet us now, Lord. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Fill us till our cups overflow. And as we come to worship you this morning, Lord, we're mindful of those on our sick and shut-in list. We give thanks that Brother Washington Randall has been released from the hospital on last week. And we also, Lord God, lift up those who have lost loved ones in the persons of Susan and Derek Howard as they will go to Carbondale this week to celebrate the life of Susan's mother, Jolene Mosley. Be with them, Lord, as they travel to and fro from Nashville to Carbondale. Be with their family, Lord God. Bless them, strengthen them, protect them, we do pray in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we pray for world peace. We know, Lord God, that you use those who seem unusable to do your will. We pray for the nation of Ukraine, Lord, in this onslaught by Vladimir Putin. While they may be outgunned, outmanned, outmatched militarily, Lord God, they have a spirit that has slowed the progress of the, Ro of the Russian invasion. Strengthen them, Lord. Give them the resolve to keep standing firm. Be with their president. And be with the nations of this world that, Lord God, help them confront the evil before them. May there be peace, Lord. May, they, may, they, may there be peace on earth. And help, Lord God, that it would start with each one of us in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our states, in our nation. Let peace begin with each one of us. Now, Lord, as we worship, be with our preacher this morning. May he break unto us a bread of life, looking at the life of Eve. But Lord, more than anything else, let us know that you are our God and we are your people. And we come to you to praise you and give you all the thanks for all you've done in this world and for us. We just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord, for your mighty gifts, your wondrous mercy, your love and your compassion. We give thanks and say amen and amen. scripture today um, comes from the book of Genesis chapter our scripture today comes from the book of Genesis chapter number 3 verse 20 and it reads Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living amen
trials. Every trials and temptations. Is there trouble anyway? Is there trouble anyway? Our precious Savior. Our precious Savior. He is still our He's still our refuge. Take it to the Lord and pray. Take it to the Lord and pray. For some things we have not. Some things we not. Because. Because we have not. When we have a friend who's there. He hears your moans and your groans. Come on, take it to the Lord. Come on, let's celebrate the one who lives tonight. Come on, let's celebrate the one who lives tonight. The one who's strong enough to carry your burdens uh, when your body fails on you. The one who can carry uh, all of your needs, uh, all of your problems. Uh, and I take it and trust him tonight.
Amen. Take it to the Lord in prayer. We're so grateful again for the opportunity to share with God in worship and to share with one another, not only those who are present here in the sanctuary, but also those who are sharing with us online. Today is um, uh, still in the month of uh, Women's History Month, Women's History Month, and uh, we affirm um, the roles of women in life and in living, not simply because of the fact and that for probably each one of us, it was a woman who was involved in our birth. Um, but we affirm because of the fact that not only that they are God's creation, but they have made some tremendous contributions uh, to the life and to living beyond just making sure that we were here. And so we do celebrate with uh, the women uh, and with others as we celebrate Women's History Month. Uh, in that spirit, it was uh, my thinking that uh, we would focus today's sermon on some aspect of women in the Bible. Last year, if I'm not mistaken, I did preach a whole month on uh, various women in the Bible and did not want this month to, to go by without our uh, at least acknowledging and to recognize uh, that there are many women who played many roles in the life uh, of what, what is our Bible. And similarly, as we do with Black History Month, that we don't confine our conversations, our preaching, and our teachings just to the month of February that deals with those who are from the continent of Africa. Uh, so we don't do the same with Women's History Month. It's just simply that because it is this month that we also want to make sure and that we place some emphasis upon uh, the roles and the contributions of women in life and living. With that being said, I um, wanted to look today at the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, where Genesis means beginning. It is the first book in our Bible. It is a part of a series of books which is called the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch, which means the first five books of the Bible or the law. Uh, there are those who would say that the book of Genesis, as it is the other four books in the Pentateuch, were all written by Moses. My suspicion is that it was not written by Moses. Um, matter of fact, in my study, you know, that uh, the book of Genesis was written by several authors. Sometimes it was considered to be a group of authors who wrote it that. As a matter of fact, there are those who believe that one group wrote what is called first Genesis and another group wrote what is called second Genesis. And that's why you know, there may be some challenges in terms of following uh, the sequence of the stories because first Genesis and second Genesis both deal with creations, but they deal with two different aspects of, of creation. Um, so we look at the book of Genesis today, um, not, and let me say this now because I may forget to say it later. later. Uh, I am not one who ascribes uh, that the book of Genesis is a very literal interpretation of what happened at creation, okay? I'm not saying that now. Um, you know, because it's, if, if, you, if you know just a little bit more than what you learn in Bible study and, and in school, then you will understand that there are a lot of challenges for saying this is a literal interpretation, that it started with God creating Adam, then out of Adam's rib came woman, and, um, and even some of the other stories that are in um, the first few chapters of the book of Genesis. As a matter of fact, when I took Old Testament history um, in, in seminary, um, my professor didn't even touch the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. He said, we ain't gonna start here, we're gonna start over here in chapter 11, latter part of chapter 11. And uh, because of the fact that, um, because of how the information is there and what all is there does not give us a literal understanding of what happened. However, I do believe that God's word is in the complete Bible. I do believe God intended for these books to be here uh, because God has a message in them. God has some very specific things that God wanted us to know. And even as the ancient writers may have told us a story of Adam and Eve, um, we may not look at it literally, but we do look at it theologically. To look at it theologically means that we're looking at it in a way that what is God really trying to tell me in the midst of all of this? That's what we do. That's what we do. And so that's my perspective. You're welcome to have your own perspectives as, uh, as you read uh, the Bible. 
Um, I do believe, as I stated already, that it is God's word, and God is intending to share something with us. Thus, why we are looking, why we are looking at the book of Genesis today. Thank um, Brother Amos for sharing with us um, from reading from Genesis, the third chapter, and verse number 20. And even though this is the one verse we're looking at, I'm actually going to expand the understanding to other verses as well. It's kind of hard to pick and choose. I figured this one would help us in what we're trying to do today. Genesis, the third chapter, verse number 20, and reading from the New International Version. Adam named his wife Eve because she, was become, she would become the mother of all the living. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In the precious and loving name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to use as a tag for this message today, Lessons from the Life of Eve. Lessons from the Life of Eve. If you know very few stories in the Bible, among those that you would know, is the fact that there is a story of Adam and Eve. In reality, if you read the story, and perhaps what you know about the story, uh, Eve gets a really, really bad rap in this whole situation. Here it is, as the story goes, that uh, Eve uh, was connived by a talking snake that had feet. Um, and uh, the snake told Eve, listen, you need to eat from this tree that God said don't eat from. And Eve said, but God said we shouldn't do this. And, and so this dialogue goes forth, and the serpent um, convinces Eve as the story. This is biblical in terms of the literal biblical interpretation, that Eve who agreed to eat uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and uh, also gave some to Adam, and Adam ate some as well. And after they ate the fat, they, they, they developed this new sense of knowledge, this great insight that they got from eating from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is what they learned. This is what they learned. This is in the Bible. They learned that they were naked. That's it. That's, that's, that's what, what happened there. And because they were naked, they decided they're going to cover themselves. Eve gets a pretty bad rap uh, in terms of, of, of this whole story. And oftentimes, particularly those who try to create battles within the sexes, they want Eve to be the scapegoat. They, no, they don't refer to her as they say she's the one. If Eve hadn't done that, matter of fact, even Adam himself said, listen, God, this is your fault and it's her fault. It is your fault, God, because you gave me this woman, and I was listening to her, and I knew I should not have listened. That's part of the battle. That's part of the discussion that goes on here in this story. And, and even with all of that that is there, I think that Eve gets a bad rap. I think that we just look at her in such a negative light, light and, and in that negative light, sometimes it causes us one bad mistake as we would say, it causes people to have their whole life tainted in that kind of way. But I, I, I contend that there are lessons that we can learn from the life of Eve. Don't look at her as a negative character. As a matter of fact, all of us have at least made one mistake, and at least most of us have made at least one mistake in our lives. And it should not taint the rest of our lives for that. But as we look at this particular passage of Scripture, I think there are things in there that can help us as we try to draw some understanding as to what God is trying to tell us, even in this story, in this parable of what we see here uh, in terms of, of Eve. Eve has something she wants to share with us. First place, we must understand that when we look at the life of Eve, that choices have 
consequences. Choices have consequences. Among the greatest gifts that God ever gave to us is the capacity to make choices. I am so grateful that I'm not a marionette. For those who remember marionettes, those are those little puppets that pull by the string and that I only move when, when God or some other uh, celestial being is pulling the strings. I can only talk when there's something that is moving my mouth, as you see, in terms of puppets. I'm glad that I don't do things simply because of the fact there is some other entity that is forcing me to do that. I am so grateful that God has given me the capacity and the ability to make choices so I can make the choices that I need to make in life. As a matter of fact, that each day, on average, a human being will make 35,000 choices. 35, give or take a few thousand, okay? But you'll make up to 35,000 choices. You made a choice as to when you're going to get up from your sleep, even though it's daylight savings time. You either set your alarm or whatever the case, and if the alarm went off, you made the decision. If I'm going to get up when the alarm goes off, I'm going to push the snooze button and give me another nine minutes of it. That's a choice you made. You made a choice on how long you're going to brush your teeth to make sure that you don't get decay and the cavity there, um, when you're going to take your shower and other kind of things, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're not going to eat, what you're not going to eat. You, you made a choice as to whether or not you're going to tune in to this broadcast today whether or not you're going to watch it on YouTube, or you can watch it on the website, watch it on Facebook Live, or watch it live and in living color. You made all of those choices. You made the choices of what to wear. The list goes on of the 35,000 things you're making choices, and perhaps uh, a third of them you've already made today. You've got uh, two-thirds more worth of choices that are on your horizon, choices that we make. <clears throat> And all the choices we make have consequences. All of them do. <clears throat> Not all of them are major consequences. You know, if you, if you decide what you're going to eat, then it, it may give you the energy that you need for that moment, and that's a choice, and that's a consequence of it. If you eat something that's not healthy for you, then that's also a consequence for that. Um, for those who, uh, who smoke, or those of you who are smokers or, or vapors, you know, that uh, we realize that there are choices that you make and it may give you a moment of pleasure, but also there are consequences uh, based on your, what your health, what could be happen in, in your health. There are choices that we make all of the time. And I wonder sometimes, I wonder sometimes if the choice that Eve and Adam made, if they knew what the consequences were, would they have made a different choice? They knew, what the, they knew that what was going to happen would banish them from paradise, or banish them from being in a place where everything was perfect. I wonder if they would have made the same choice. Matter of fact, if you read the passages of Scripture, first, second, and third uh, chapters of the book of Genesis, you'll notice that God never tells them what the consequences are of their choice. God just tells them, don't eat from that tree that's in the middle of the garden. It's a tree of life that is there, and it's also the tree, and that is the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God just says, don't do it. God doesn't tell them, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Kind of like what we did with our children. What I did with my children, I said, if you do that, I'm going to spank your behind. And uh, sometimes they called my bluff on it. Sometimes they didn't call my bluff on it. And, uh, but, 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 but God didn't give them the consequence of what they had done. God just told them, this is what I need you to know. This is what I'm asking you to do. And I'm expecting you to make the choice that you're going to do what I have asked you to do in obedience to what it is that is my expectation. And even though uh, Eve knew, she had to know what the consequence was, I knew that there would be consequences. I knew what God had asked them. She still made the choice that I'm going to eat from this tree. 
Now, we, I know uh, even as the graphic we have here makes it look like if it was an apple, it wasn't really an apple. We don't know what kind of tree it was. We don't know what the fruit is. But oftentimes, we associate it with the apple. And, uh, but the reality of it is that, that we, 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 we know that she ate. We believe, as the story tells us, that she ate. She gave it to Adam, and Adam ate it as well. But I think the message God is trying to tell us is not so much whether it was an apple, not so much whether or not it was Eve who ate and gave it to Adam. I think what God is trying to tell us is that God wants us to make the right choices regardless of what the consequences may be. God wants us to make the right choices because it's the right thing to do that you make those choices, that you do these things because of the fact that it is, it is important. It is good for your health to make good choices in terms of what you eat. It's input, good for you in terms of, of, of other choices we make. Uh, if you go out of work and, and have an honest living, then therefore it's a good chance you can get other things. The consequences will be that life will be able to be more manageable for you. We've got to learn not to make choices because we're fearful of the negative consequences. We ought not to make, that ought not to be our motivating factor. Our desire ought to be because we want to do what is right. Many times people, people are, 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 are scared into the church, you know, because they're afraid they're gonna go to hell. So they, because they, they don't wanna go to hell, so I'm gonna go to church. I don't want the devil to be on my tail, so I'm gonna go to church. That ought not to be your motivator. You're made a motivator. Your motivator ought to be that my desire is to be in fellowship with God. My desire is to, be, is, is to be in an intimate relationship with the Lord. My desire is for my life to be, <clears throat> to see, for me to see and to acknowledge the blessings that God has in store for me. That ought to be your motivator, not because you're trying to avoid a negative consequence, but that you're trying to do that which is, that is what is right, what is, what is important. We have, uh, and, I'll, and I'll introduce him more formally later, but we have here in our congregation the district attorney for um, the uh, uh, Fort Davidson County, I guess it is. And, um, but his job is to prosecute those persons who've made poor choices. That's what it is, you know. People who've made poor choices found themselves making decisions, knowing what the consequences may be. And they know that the consequences could put them in jail or could lead them to something that's even more, uh, more serious than that. They make those choices, and people all the time are making choices. Out of the 35,000 decisions that they make every day, sometimes they make those choices because of the fact that they know, um, even though they know that the consequences may not be well. We must understand when we look at these lessons from Eve that, that, that choices have consequences. Not all of them negative, some of them positive, Many of them positive, as a matter of fact. Many of them are helpful, but it is those choices that we can face in terms of the consequences. But don't make those choices based on the negative consequences that could be there. Second thing I want us to keep in mind when we look at uh, the lessons from the life of Eve is not only do choices have consequences, but also God never abandons. God never abandons. Look again, if you will, at the story. You'll know that uh, Adam and Eve in the story did something that was contrary to the will of God. God had very specifically told them that I don't want you to do this. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't do it. Don't do, do not do it. Y'all can have anything else. You're in paradise. You're, you're able to enjoy the benefits and the fruit, literally, of everything else here. Just don't do this. And even though God said don't do this, they went on and did that. But yet even with that, God did not abandon them. Look, if you will, at what the story is telling us, that uh, after they had done that, they hid from God. And God went looking for them. After they had, did, after they had done that, that God, uh, they didn't want to talk with God, but God wanted to talk with them. After they had done that, and they recognized or they, they felt that their nakedness was wrong, and God 
came and prepared clothes for them to wear. God is always like that. Even when we have done things that are contrary to the will of God, when we have done things that are inconsistent with what is a part of our faith training and our, and our understanding that in spite of all of those things, God is still willing to be there to help us. Not only willing, God will not abandon us. God will not forsake us. God will not leave us out of there just because we've chosen to make wrong decisions. God just decides I've got to work with him a little longer. God just decides I've got to do a little more with her. God just decides that I've got to help him. I've got to, I've got to stay with them. I've got to, I've, got to, I've got to stay with them and let them know that even with their bad choices, even with the consequences of their choices, that I'm going to have to uh, relate to him, relate to her uh, in a different kind of way because God's desire always is to restore, is to repair and to restore our relationship. That's what God is always doing. That is what all God is always engaged in doing, trying to repair and to restore the brokenness that we have created, indicating the fact that God never abandons us. Now, you know, you look at what we do. <laughs> we abandon folk all the time. Don't let somebody say something the wrong way to us. I'm through with him. I ain't got nothing to do with him. I ain't got nothing to do with her. Let somebody do something that, 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 that hurts us, that, that causes pain or toil or uh, trauma in our lives. I ain't, ain't going to fool with him no more. I'm not going to mess with her any longer. We, we will abandon folk uh, in a hot second, even though people are human. They make mistakes. And, 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 and we feel as if I don't want to have anything to do with them. I hear people say that all the time. Almost every week I hear somebody say, I ain't going to fool with him. I'm not going to bother him. I'm not going to mess with her. I'm not going to deal with her, you know, because that's just the way they are. What if God had said that about us? That God has said that I'm not going to fool with you anymore. I know that in the Old Testament, over particularly when you see the people, the people of Israel as they were moving from uh, Egypt over to the promised land that God in a couple of times uh, in the narrative says that, you know, I will not fool with them. I'm going to wipe them all out. Even uh, early in the book, uh, in, uh, in another part of the book of Genesis, that God actually does wipe out humanity except for Noah and his family. But yet even in the midst of all of this, this is just a part of the rhetoric of the Bible. But we do know that God has not, God will not abandon us. God would never forsake us. God would never uh, leave us out of there to deal with things all by ourselves. We know, we know that the Bible tells us, the New Testament, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible also tells us in the New Testament, these are writings from the Apostle Paul, that tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The Bible does tell us also that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing can do that. We hear these words that are being spoken over and over again. This is what the New Testament does for us. This is what the life of Jesus does. Matter of fact, Jesus himself is God telling us that I have not abandoned you. Y'all messed up. You do wrong. You act wrong. You've been doing wrong, you act wrong, and you're going to mess up again. But I want you to know that it is in Jesus Christ that you always have an avenue, a way to get to restore that relationship, to, to repair that which is broken, to come back because of the fact God is always there to help us even when, 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 uh, when we've done wrong. God never abandons us. God is always there. God is always willing to bring us back into fellowship. Final thing I want to suggest to us as we look at this whole business of lessons from the life of Eve, not only do we realize that choices have consequences, and not only do we understand from the lesson that God never abandons, also never abandon God. I said just a moment ago, God never abandons. Now I'm saying, never abandon God. Eve messed up, big time. 
Adam messed up big time, as the story goes. We, we understand that. They, you know, and, and there are those who, uh, there's uh, the train of thought that's also uh, very predominant in, within Christian culture, that uh, what happened with Adam and Eve is called the original sin. And all of us are still dealing with that. Here it is, some several thousand years later, and that we're still dealing with what Adam and Eve had done there. The consequences of their choices have continued to, uh, to, to run uh, the whole gamut, and even in terms of life today, as, as it is understood. But yet, even though they messed up, let me go this way, oftentimes when people mess up, they begin to abandon those things that have been there for them. They've, been, they, they've chosen to, to, to give up on, on things. Here we are in the season of trauma, the season that has been going on for some two years, whereby we have uh, been dealing with this pandemic. And there are those we would have thought would have come into their relationship, come closer in terms of their relationship with God. But they've chosen to abandon the Lord instead. They figure if God's going to make me go through this, then I don't need to worship God. I don't need to be a part of that which God has, uh, has done, God is doing, God may do for us. There are those who have abandoned God. Um, they have stopped doing the things that would help them to develop their spirituality and their nurturing. They have abandoned God. They have felt that God had abandoned them, and so therefore if God's going to abandon them, they're going to give up on God. But what we look in this lesson from Eve, from the life of Eve, is that when you look at that passage, particularly when you go over to the fourth chapter, beginning of the fourth chapter, Adam and Eve get busy. You can understand what that means. And so if you have a PG audience, y'all tell them later what it means, okay? They got busy. And in their getting busy, they began to have children. They had Cain and Abel. Eve made the statement that it is the Lord who gave them the children, gave them the son and eventually other children later on. That Eve, even though she had messed up, Eve, though she had uh, caused trauma in terms of this whole creative order, uh, Eve and Adam, in light of all that they have done, but yet Eve still understood that God is still in charge. God is still in control. That in spite of what we do, in spite of the mistakes we've made, in spite of uh, the challenges in our lives, in spite of all those things, we must still understand that God is still in charge. God is still in control. We still need, we need to understand what Job said, that, you know, naked I came into this world, naked I shall leave. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And our philosophy, our, our life story ought to always be, in spite of what we go through, that blessed be the name of the Lord. Those who are in my Bible study class know that oftentimes I refer to Daniel, the third chapter, story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And in that story that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the king, wanted them to bow down to the image of gold and, uh, that, uh, that, that he had erected and, and, and to worship the image when the music would start playing. And the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came up to Nebuchadnezzar and said, listen, you know, we're not going to bow down and worship because we have a God that we know is and is and, and is able and is willing to deliver us. God can and will deliver us. That's not the most important statement in that whole passage of scripture. The most important statement is the next one, where they say, but if not, even if God does not deliver us, we still will not bow down and worship the image of gold. We must understand that in our own lives and in our own living, we cannot abandon God. God is always working on our behalf. God is always doing things. God, it may not look like it right now, but we do know that God has something on the horizon. God has something that is there that's going to help us to make it uh, through all of life's challenges. Don't get discouraged. Don't become afraid. Don't feel as if because things don't look the way that you want them to be right now that maybe you need to give up on God. But don't give up on God because God has never given up on you. And God is willing to be there to help us through whatever it is we have to go through. 
The story of Adam and Eve is one, you can take it whatever way you want to look at it. But I believe that there are some lessons that are in there that God is trying to help us to know and to understand. God says that your choices, choices have consequences. God says that, that God will never abandon us. God is going to always be there for us. But the lesson also is for us to never abandon God. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. God will direct your path. We must understand how it is that, that God is here to give us life and to give it more abundantly. Perhaps there are those who are listening, those who are part of our broadcast, whether you're here in the sanctuary or those who are watching online, who have uh, struggled in terms of the uh, choices that we've made. Sometimes the choices have caused uh, great stress and strain in our lives. Sometimes the choices have uh, caused trauma for us. Choices that have uh, altered the course of our lives cause us to have to look at life and to deal with life in a different kind of way. And yet even with those choices, I want you to know today that, that uh, no matter how good or how difficult your life has been, God is still here for you. The Lord wants me to tell you today that you need to just make sure that you don't abandon the Lord, that you come into fellowship, come into relationship, come, in, come into that desire of repairing that which is broken, that has been broken. The Lord invites you to come to him today. We invite those of you who are online to call us here at the church building. Our phone number is 615-255-8757. Press a zero, and there is someone who will answer the call for you, and they will talk with you. They will share with you. They will help you to understand that your choices don't have to be the final say in your life. The choices that you've made are only things that are consequential, yes, but even though they're consequential, God has a greater consequence, and that is to come into that relationship with Jesus Christ. And, or if you're here, we ask you to come and to consider being a part of the Christian fellowship, being a part of that body of believers, of those of us who have not all made good choices, not all made the right choices, not always done that which is right, not always uh, realized that, that, that there are things that we can do, things that we can say, that are contrary to that which is the will of God. And yet we invite you to come to connect with the one who will never abandon you, never leave you, never walk out on you, never turn the Lord's back on you, but always will be there for you, to guide you and direct you through no matter, no matter what it is that, that you're called upon to face. So we ask that you will embrace the Lord. We're going to ask that we will bow our heads, that we will close our eyes, and that we will offer our own prayers of submission unto the Lord, our own prayers of, of, of gratitude for what it is God has done and what God is doing in our lives. Precious and eternal God, we're so grateful that we have a friend in you. You are a friend that will be with us no matter what our circumstances may be. No matter how we have abandoned you, no matter how we have done wrong to you, how long, no matter what we have done that has been contrary to that which is your will. We know, Lord, that you're that kind of friend. You're the one who will be willing to walk with us and to talk with us and always claim us and reclaim us even when we've gone astray. Lord, we need that in this world where, you know, so many times that um, the way that our dispositions are, it's so easy for us to have broken relationships and broken friendships and broken uh, lives because of the fact that there are those who no longer are willing or able to associate with us. We need to know that in spite of all that may happen in our human relationships, that our one with the spiritual one is always there for us. We need to know, Lord, that you are there. And you speak that truth to us in so many different ways of our lives. 
through our worship, through our prayer, through our devotion, through the times you have protected us from the snares of the devil, times when you have walked with us and talked with us and claimed us, and let others know that we are connected with you. So we ask, Lord, right now that you will continue to speak peace to our hearts and our minds and our spirits. Help us, dear Lord, to know that in spite of all things, that you're with us every step of the way. Let us, Lord, to continue to acknowledge and to see your blessings around us. Sometimes the blessings are clouded by life circumstances. But I pray, Lord, that you will peel back the clouds just enough for us to know that there are things that are happening on our horizons that are blessings that come from you that are going to make a difference in our lives and our living. Continue, Lord, to grant us your grace, grant us your mercy. In the name of Jesus and for his sake we pray. Amen. Amen. We do thank God for all of the blessings that God has given to us and among the ways in which we um, share our appreciation to God is through the giving of our tithes and through our offerings. Before we get to that, I do want to uh, formally uh, mention to you that we have our district attorney here for Davidson County, uh, Brother uh, Glenn Funk, won't you stand? And so we can see you, and uh, glad that he has come to share with us as a part of our worship. Mm -hmm. um, Brother Funk, Funk is running for re-election, and so uh, he's here, he's going to take an opportunity following the service to uh, greet those who wish to meet him and to greet him, those who are present. Those who ain't here, you'll miss the opportunity. But those who are present, if you want to speak with uh, Brother Funk, uh, you got somebody in jail, you want him to get you? No, I can't, <laughs> can't tell me. <laughs> but, um, but we do ask that if you at least uh, meet him, if you ask him whatever questions you have um, um, uh, as, as a candidate for this office, then uh, you're welcome to do that. You can do that following the service uh, today. We also have with us, I understand it's not running for re-election. You are for the re-election too? In 24. Okay, oh in 24, she's got two years to go. And that is Sister Vivian Wilhort, who's our property assessor. And so she's the one who, make sure that your taxes stay low, right? Your property taxes. Yeah. The value, the property value, that's right. And uh, she just enforces the laws that are there, but she's here sharing with us uh, in worship uh, as well. But we're glad that they've chosen to come to the First Baptist Church Capitol Hill to be with us today. And uh, we're glad that, that you've chosen. And please feel free to come back, uh, whether it's before 24 or even after 22, okay? <laughs> and so to share with us. Now, we're going to ask that uh, we will take time to receive our offering. We're going to have our prayer. Uh, after we have our prayer, then uh, we'll receive our offering for today. <laughs> Most gracious Heavenly Father, we humbly come before your throne this morning to present our gifts of our tithes and offerings in accordance with your word. We pray, Lord, that these offerings will be used to uplift, to encourage those not only in our community, but those in communities beyond. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all the many blessings you've bestowed upon us. And it is in the peerless, perfect, and precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to mention, thank you, uh, Deacon Wood, that for those of you who are online, uh, we have an opportunity for you to, to, for you to give through an app that you can put on your smartphone, which is called Givelify. Uh, if you go to that app, uh, go to the place where it says uh, First Baptist Church Capitol Hill, then you can indicate the amount that you want to give. Or you're welcome to mail it to us here in the church building, 900 Nelson Mary Street, Nashville, excuse me, Nashville, Tennessee, 37203. Those who are here in the sanctuary, our ushers will be able to assist us. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Uh, some, oh, Spiritual Renewal Week. You saw the announcements that were up there. We we're going to have uh, our Spiritual Renewal Week, which is comparable to what other churches call revival. March 21 through 23, it'll be uh, each evening at 6 o'clock p.m. We hope that you already will put it on your calendar, will put it on your calendar so that you can make sure you know, that uh, you're tuning in. We will have in-person worship, so you're welcome to come and to share with us in the sanctuary, or you can watch it online. But we're looking forward to it. We have three young persons who are going to uh, be preaching for us that week. Uh, three persons here in the city of Nashville, and we're excited to give young people an opportunity to preach here at First Baptist Church Capitol Hill. Gives us a chance to hear them, give them a chance to be heard, and we pray that uh, you will tune in for us on the 21st or the 23rd, not this coming week, but the following week. Uh, we ask that you will join in with us. Don't forget Bible study this coming Wednesday. Um, we're going to talk about giving. We're going to talk about giving. So don't get excited. Don't get, uh, uh, don't, don't run from the consequences of giving. Uh, but make sure that you come and tune in as we talk about that at noon as well as at 6 o'clock on this coming Wednesday. We have a lesson that we ask that you will uh, read leading up to it. If you don't get the emails from us, then contact the church office. And we'll make sure that we send those, uh, that email to you. That's it. I've said enough. We're going to sing, God be with you. After we've sung that, that we'll receive the benediction and we'll be dismissed. Let us all stand. Another wave it, uh, yeah, wave in those at home, y'all wave in me, okay? Mm. All right, very good. We also want to remind you that Children's Church is going to start at noon, okay? So we ask that uh, that you'll tune in or be here. If you hear the on virtual, it's all virtual, okay? All virtual. So Children's Church, we want to remind you to have your children to tune in at noon uh, to our uh, to our online services. So please make sure you do that, okay? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make the Lord's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn the Lord's face toward you and grant you peace. And now, henceforth, evermore, amen. amen.